Mark, you really inspired me. Uh, we spoke at least a couple of years ago, and you shared with me an incredible insight that the changes in regulations allowing real estate sponsors to raise money online was a marketing opportunity. So I'd l I really want to talk to you about that. That's what I'm doing now. I provide, uh, you asked me, I provide marketing and digital marketing and social media services to sponsors to raise capital. But before we get into that, let me ask you one question and let's address our conversation to those in our audience who still don't know you can do it, right? Uh, is it legal, first of all, to raise, to raise capital online? And if so, tell me the story of how that came to be. No, it's not, not legal at all. And what's your next question? <laughs> what are you doing for lunch? Uh, right, we'll cancel now. Okay. Well, uh, so my, my, uh, my answer is going to go back many years into American history. But then it's going to really quickly come up back up to date. So don't think I'm going to go like month to month. <laughs> but we, we had a great world depression back in the 1920s, as everyone knows, I believe. Or actually, you know, I don't know whether people younger than me do know. But <laughs> you, <know, laughs> you were there. My, right, right. my grandparents <laughs> lived through it. So I am, I am maybe the last generation that actually you know, remembers we had a Great Depression, not just in this country, but, but all over the world. And it led to the rise of Nazi Germany and all kinds of bad things. Um, and um, one of the causes um, of the Great Depression in this country was that American capital markets had become basically a swamp filled with investor uh, fraud and stock market manipulation and, and so on and so forth. And when you live in a capitalist country as, as we do and your capital markets uh, collapse, you, you have a depression. And therefore one of the, uh, as I'm sure all your listeners know, Franklin Roosevelt was elected president for the first time in, in 1932 and um, one of the very first things he did, uh, teaming up with a Texas Democrat uh, named Sam Rayburn, who's, who went on to an extremely illustrious career, um, they teamed up and wrote the U.S. securities laws as we, as we now know them. So it's not a coincidence that all of the securities laws that you read about today, you read on the internet, well, what's what laws you know, affect cryptocurrencies, these brand new digital assets? And people are always talking about uh, the Securities Act of 1933, the Exchange Act of 1934, the Investment <laughs> Company Act of 1940. It's not a coincidence that those laws were written at that time because um, they were written in direct response to the collapse of our capital markets in the, in the late 1920s. Um, and the, the result is we, in this country, we got the most stringent, uh, transparent securities laws in the world. And a result of that has been we, not coincidentally, we have the um, most efficient and most trusted and most valuable capital markets in the world. Okay, so I go back into that history to give your listeners, that person that you referred to, who's not <laughs> sure whether we can do all this, um, some sense of the history behind the rules. And ever since the 1930s, since the 1933 Act, um, there has been, have been a few fundamental rules about American securities laws. And one of the most fundamental rules that every young security lawyer learns at his mother's knee <laughs> is that there is a difference between public offerings of securities and private offerings. And the difference is that in a public offering, you can advertise. A, an old, let's take an old school company, 
General Motors or a new uh, a new school company um, Uber, those companies can advertise their securities publicly. Here, come buy our securities. They can say in the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. But conversely, a private company, a real estate developer buying an apartment building in Austin, for example, could not advertise. And everyone knows that. And, you know, instead of advertising, that developer has to know people or know people who know people or know people who know people who know people. <laughs> Very inefficient mm. uh, series of barely connected private networks, basically. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm finally going to answer your question. It is that longstanding rule that was changed in 2012 mm -hmm. when then President Barack Obama signed into law the Jobs Act of 2012 on, I believe, May 5th, 2012. And although there's lots of complicated rules including in that, uh, included in that law, the single thing that transformed the capital formation industry is a reversal of that 85 year old rule. So whereas you could not advertise before the Jobs Act, after the Jobs Act, you can advertise virtually any way you want. In fact, when I do a lot of public speaking and I'll be moderating a panel of lawyers and I will say, what kind of advertising can you not do under Rule 506C? And people get a a little bit of a worried expression on their face, like don't ask me, but it's a trick question because <laughs> there is no advertising that you cannot do under Rule 506C. So I've probably been talking long enough, but you said, <laughs> how do you go about doing it? Right. As you know, there are three kinds of crowdfunding and we can talk about those if you want to, but they all have in common mm. the reversal of this longstanding rule. So you can now advertise your private deal publicly. 